Welcome to the Kite Pharma Information Session and Interview Skills Workshop with IG. Um, we are recording this currently. It will be posted to IG's YouTube channel. If you're not comfortable being in the recording, um, do not speak and do not put your camera on and you will not end up, your face won't end up in the recording. Um, if you do speak, your voice will be there. Um, but if you would rather not be, that's totally fine. Just don't unmute and don't have your camera on. Um, and then please send it at the QR code on the left. That just helps us know who got here and how we're gonna make our events better in the future. So yeah, welcome to our event. Uh, we're going to begin with a quick introduction, or I guess our agenda, forgot the slide was here. Um, Cutting reminder, check that off the list. So we're going to start with a Kite Pharma information, information session, followed by some interview skills and tips, followed by some workshopping and breakout rooms, and then a quick note about our upcoming events and a bit of a closing. So that's where we're headed today, and I'm glad you're along for the ride. So Kite Pharma is a biotech company. They're based in Santa Monica in beautiful California. Their primary focus is cell therapy to treat cancer. They were founded in 2009. And I found this very interesting on their Wikipedia page. They are ranked seventh on the list of 50 smartest companies by this particular review board in 2017. I don't know what smartest company means, but it means if it means that I want to work there, then I, I, that, I'd be happy with that. So Kite Pharma, would you like to take it away? Yeah, sure. All right, uh, let me share my screen. All right, cool. All right. First of all, thank you, Aichi, for letting us come here and speak about our company today. Um, my name is Aaron Ramos, and I work at Kite Pharma as a manufacturing uh, technician within our manufacturing support group um, here in Oceanside, so like not too far from UCSD. And at Oceanside, our site is also a viral vector production plant. So the viral vector is a major component of our um, CAR T cell therapy, which we'll talk about in our presentation. But yeah, that's just a little intro on me. Um, would the rest of uh, my team like to introduce themselves? Uh, sure, I can go. So uh, my name is Alexa. I graduated from UCSD in 2016 with my bachelor's in public health. I've been at Kite Pharma alongside with Aaron um, for a little over a year and a half now. We work on the same team. Um, I think that's it. That's all I have. Okay, I'll go next. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly, and I work at Kite in Santa Monica. Um, I work in the process development group um, doing analytical development. So I focus on developing different types of assays, um, mostly potency cell based methods. I actually started, I went to UCSD and I started at Gilead Sciences in Oceanside first, where Aaron and Alexa are. And then I transferred over to Kite a couple of years ago. Hi everyone, I'm John Majewski. I work at Gilead Sciences uh, based in Foster City in the Bay Area. Um, I'm in uh, device development and clinical packaging engineering. And my background is in biomedical engineering and I graduated from UCSD with a master's in medical device engineering in 2015. Thanks. Great. And oh yeah, I don't think I said this, but I also graduated in June of 2020 um, with a bachelor's in chemical engineering. All right, so I just wanted to go through our little info session slide that we've prepared to give you guys a general overview of um, Gilead as a company, Gilead slash Kite Pharma as a company. So here's our agenda. I'll first go through who we are, our core values, our ERGs, which are like our organizations within the company, um, briefly touch on philanthropy, and then go over opportunities with early talent, which I'm sure most of you will be most interested in. And then lastly, we'll leave some time at the end if you have any questions, we're here to answer them. So starting off, um, Gilead was founded in 1987 and we've always had this brand statement of creating possible. And essentially what that means is that Gilead has always uh, wanted to develop life-changing medicines for patients and um, with an emphasis on being innovative. So over the last 30 years, Gilead has developed more than 25 um, different types of medicines that impact millions of patients all over the world. So here's a little timeline of the most, um, I guess, important or some of the events that stood out most in Gilead's history. Um, but to kind of touch on the ones that I think are most notable, um, Firstly, in the 90s, one of Gilead's early successes was with Tamiflu, which is used to treat severe cases of the flu. And then one of Gilead's um, 
biggest innovations was in treating H or creating HIV medicines, which have turned HIV from a disease that was very deadly to one that could be managed in the long term. And building off of that experience with HIV, uh, multiple hepatitis treatments and cures have been developed as a result. And so moving on into 2017, Gilead acquired Kite, which is why they're kind of like um, named together usually. And Kite Pharma, where some of us work, is or has been a leader in cell therapy with its transformative product, Jescarta, which is a type of CAR T cell therapy, which I'll talk about in a later slide. And then um, one of the more recent um, innovations of Gilead, as I'm sure some of you have heard, was its um, development of remdesivir, which was used to um, treat uh, severe cases of COVID-19. So yeah, there's that. Um, moving on to the next slide. To reiterate some of our main therapeutic areas, again, HIV has been a core part of Gilead's business. And it kind of, Gilead has sort of cast this big net over different methods of treating HIV, including prevention with the treatment prep, um, treating with single tablet regimens. And of course, we're continually doing research to ultimately find a cure for HIV. And still within the realm of virology, um, with that knowledge of treatment for HIV, Gilead has been able to um, produce a cure for hepatitis C and also continues to do research on different types of um, hepatitis as well. Moving into the area of oncology, Gilead started to do or move into the area of cancer treatments in 2017 when they acquired Kite, as I mentioned before. And Kite has been a leader in CAR T cell um, or CAR T technology. And I wanted to just briefly give an overview of what that looks like, because I think it's really interesting. So this is different than normal chemotherapy because the way CAR T cell therapy works to treat cancer is that you first collect a patient's white blood cells and then you isolate those, isolate their T cells and activate them. And then you essentially retrain those cells to identify and um, attack and destroy um, the cancer cells by genetic modification. And then once that's done, you will grow and expand those number of T cells and then reinfuse them back into the patient, which is shown to um, have a significant um, increase in the chance of remission of that patient. So it's a relatively new technology and one that Kite um, is well known for. All right, and moving on to the area of inflammation that Gilead also treats. Um, they also, or we also have um, research done in treatments for different types of arthritis, um, colitis, Crohn's disease, and also developing therapies for fibrotic diseases. So there are, there's, a lot, there's a large area of treatments that Gilead um, does research in overall. So with that being said, moving on to the culture side of working at Gilead and Kite, Gilead's core values as a company are integrity, inclusion, teamwork, excellence, and accountability. And kind of going off of that um, core value of inclusion, um, Gilead has a lot of or several employee research groups or ERGs, which were made to you know, provide opportunities for leadership development. Um, developing a sense of community within Gilead and things like that. And these are the six different ERGs that we have within Gilead and Kite. Each of them focused on a different you know, aspect of diversity. And each um, group um, has various events throughout the year. Um, specifically, since we have been moved to virtual for the past couple of years, they've all been like virtual events on Zoom. But Nevertheless, they've been pretty fun to attend. Like they have virtual game nights, um, info sessions on a different um, non-work related thing. Um, but it's a great way to get to meet other people within the company overall. All right. And so in addition to having you know, all these therapies that Gilead has, um, 
We also have a big emphasis on giving back to the community. Um, so just to briefly touch on these, um, this slide kind of gives a snapshot of Gilead's corporate social responsibility initiatives and programs across therapeutic areas. So those are aimed at reducing disparities, improving access, supporting local communities and advancing education. All right, so that basically wraps up our section on Gilead and Kite Info. And I hope it gave you a good picture of who we are, what we do, our therapies, and uh, hopefully you have some interest in starting a career here. So um, on the slide, this basically just shows um, all the different types of majors that Gilead and Kite are recruiting for. Um, engineering is definitely in here. Um, and going on to the next slide, um, if you are interested in applying to um, Gilead or Kite, um, the easiest way you can do that is just go on Google and search um, Gilead Careers. And it should be like the first thing that pops up on the top of the search page. Um, that will take you to the application site, Yellow. Um, which has more information on different types of roles there. But just to note, recently, um, like the beginning of January, over 300 internships were just posted. So if you're interested in getting an internship, um, I would highly recommend applying sooner than later, because that'll give you a better shot of, uh, you know, landing an interview or a position. There's also entry-level positions, um, rotations, um, stuff like that for graduates as well. So just check out that page. And also, if you're interested in learning more or want to connect with us, um, I believe the IGE team will be sending out our LinkedIn info. So feel free to connect with us there if you prefer to do that. Um, yeah, and then this slide is just a general timeline of the fall and spring recruiting. This one is almost done if you did happen to apply in the fall. And went through the interview process, the selections will be happening soon. Otherwise, like I said, we're recruiting now, um, starting January and finalizing selections March, April, and then May and June would be the around the time where you'd be onboarded as a new hire. And I believe that's the last slide. Yeah. So, yeah, that is my presentation, and I guess we can move on to Q and A now. If anyone has any questions. I have a question for you all. As a, say as a chemical engineering intern, what kinds of things might we be doing? I'm not a personally a chemical engineer and I'm not in the chemistry. In fact, uh, chemistry is a weak, a weak point of mine, but I work with a lot of chemists very closely. So um, I know for Gilead, it's a, very, it's a matrix organization. So you work very collaboratively with pretty much any function um, that's involved in the pharmaceutical manufacturing. So um, there's process chemistry, um, formulations development, um, analytical operations, even quality assurance. Um, so it's really, you know, you could, there's a lot of different, I'd say, flavors of, of, of what, what you might be interested in. I personally can speak for how a lot of the formulations and uh, process development interns uh, usually handle things. Um, it's a lot of um, hand, like the internships are a lot of hands-on experience in the lab, um, helping directly with the scientists that are actually doing doing the projects. And you get a lot of exposure to, uh, I think a key part of the internships is they, they try to give you a lot of exposure to um, not just one project, even though you might have one you know, overarching project, but trying to expose you to lots of different aspects of, in our case, pharmaceutical, small, ma small molecule pharmaceutical manufacturing. I'm sure uh, they could speak for a kite, but there's generally a sense of you get to see a lot of different things um, as far as the internships go. And a lot of lab work, um, but it's all it's all really focused on the pharmaceutical manufacturing, testing, those types of things. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to unmute or drop them in chat. I can mute them for you. And while I'm getting my slides up, uh, let me just give that time for anyone to think of questions. Other than that, we'll move on to the interview skills part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kai. Um, so if no one has any questions for um, the team here, I'm going to move on to the um, interview skills part of the workshop. Very exciting. I apologize in advance. I have a lot of words on these slides. I don't know what happened to me. Usually I'm not so bad about this, but 
whatever happened happened. So we're gonna get through this. All right, so we're gonna start with the basics. What is an interview? An interview is a meeting between you and a potential employer. There's kind of a goal on both sides. So the goal of the potential employer is to see if you'd be a good candidate for, your, for the job that they're looking to hire for. And they also wanna see if they could possibly work with you. Your goal is to show them that you'd be an awesome candidate for that job and that you can, and to also see if you could work with them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because it's kind of a two-way street, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you don't like your coworkers and they don't like you, that just wouldn't be good. So that's kind of the whole goal of an interview is to see if you'd be good at it and then if you can all work together. So an overview of interviews is there's a lot of different ways they can look. They can range from 10 minutes to multiple hours. They can be um, involving multiple interviewers or just one. They can involve one or multiple candidates. It could be a combination of both of those. Uh, it can be behavioral, it can be technical, it can be both. It can be in-person, virtual, or both. It can be casual, formal. Um, there's just a lot of ways the interviews can look. So your job is to pay attention to the interview invitation that you get to make sure that you prepare for the right style so that you're not caught off guard and that you know what you're, um, you know what you're in for. So let's talk about behavioral interviews. These are probably the most common type of interviews. Uh, these help your potential employer know who you are as a human. They wanna see things like your ability to work in teams, your time management skills, your multitasking skills, um, things like that that are going to be important for pretty much any job. You also want to see how you communicate and if they can mesh with that. If you have a different communication style than they used to, that might just mean that you're not uh, able to talk to them very well and they need to know that before um, they hire you. You also want to know your motivations and your values, like why are you applying to this job? What's, the, what's your goal in this? So they also want to know if you'd be a good culture fit for the company and if they could work with, work with work with you for an extended time. Um, and what I mean by that is the culture, your, your company typically has some sort of culture, um, like a particular kind of energy or mindset that you bring to work every day. And they wanna know if you'd fit into that well. Um, and also if you could just work with that particular team for a while. Because again, no one wants to be in a situation where you don't like your coworkers, that's just not a good time. And then pretty much all interviews are at least somewhat behavioral. Uh, because that's just the nature of interacting with people is they're going to you know, think about, you know, can I keep talking to you for eight more hours every day or could I not, you know, that kind of thing. So treat all interviews as a behavioral interview, even if they are technical interviews, which is what we're talking about next. So technical interviews are common for science, engineering and software roles. Uh, they are a, their goal is to assess your technical ability for a role. So what does that mean? That means um, do you have the knowledge and skills that are necessary for this particular role? Um, my roommate is a CS major and she often has to just, you know, code something in an interview and it sounds terrifying to me, but she manages it really well. Um, I just want to know that she can do it. Um, they also want to assess your problem solving skills, your communication skills, and how you behave under pressure, which I think is a very interesting way to assess that. So in these technical interviews, you might be asked to do something like complete an online or paper test. Uh, you might be asked to type into a shared document. That would be from a virtual interview or a phone interview. And then um, you might also be asked to write on a whiteboard or work directly on a computer. Uh, personally, I've never had a technical interview, so I can't speak to this as what it would be for um, chemical engineering. But you might be asked something like, what is the Navier-Stokes equation? And you might be able to write that out or something like that or, what, or describe what it, what it means. So hopefully anyone who's taken fluids can answer that question. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how to prepare for an interview. There's a lot of things to do before an interview, which is what we're going to talk about now. Um, your first step is going to be to look back at the job description. Uh, and the goal of this is to see what words they, um, they want to hear and kind of match your uh, presentation to that. So kind of like how you did for the resume, um, you know, if the word um, leadership is in the job description, you want to you know, mention the word leadership in your resume. Similar thing, if you're going to an interview, look back at the job description, if leadership is in there, talk about, um, you know, make sure you have some examples of time that you were a leader. Just make sure that you uh, know what job you're interviewing for, for the first thing, and then also make sure that you can kind of tailor your preparations to that job specifically. Second, write down, like physically write it down. Why are you interested in this job? And why would you be the best person for the role? Um, even if you don't believe you're the best person for the role, right? Why you would be the best person for the role? And even if your reason is because I want a job, because I want to make money, write that down. And then probably write something secondary to that because that's not a particularly compelling reason besides that everyone needs that. Um, so yeah, write it down so that you know in your head and you can present that um, to everyone else that you're interviewing with. You know, why you're interested in this job? Because 
um, you know, I had this relative who had this problem, this company is solving that problem. You know, it's, it's a good story. And why are you the best person for the role? That's what the rest of the preparation is for. So step three is researching the company. Um, what does this company do? You want to know that like the back of your hand. What's their mission statement? What's their culture like? You kind of want to have an idea of what it would be like to work there before you even go to the interview. Um, showing that you did your research is really important because it lets your interviewers know that you care, that you put a lot of effort into this, and that you actually do want this job because you put that much effort into it. It's very important to research the company. So then you're going to want to consider or write down or even practice some answers to common interview questions. You can Google that, just Google common interview questions, you'll get like 5,000 results, it'll be fantastic. And then you also want to prepare questions for your interviewers. Um, and that's important because you want to ask things like, what is the timeline for when I will potentially receive a yes or no to this, um, to this hire? You also want to ask things like, what is the culture like? What project will I be working on? Um, what's your favorite part about working here, things like that. You want to get to know your interviewers and asking questions is a great way to do that. Also for the common interview questions, something you can do is if you know anyone at the company, you can contact them to ask, you know, what might be a common interview question for this company or for this position. So you can prepare for that specifically and that can also help. Um, you also want to have your resume ready. So if you're doing a, um, an in-person interview, you want to have that printed. You want to have at least three to five copies available at any given time. So you can hand them out to people and be super organized and be like, this is great. You know, everyone gets an interview, uh, a resume, sorry. <laughs> and then if you are having a virtual interview, you want to do, um, just have your resume like somewhere on your desktop. So you can like, easily drag and drop it into a chat or something like that. Um, because you just want to be able to just send it along to anyone who might potentially want to see it. You also want to be ready to speak to anything on your resume. So if you put something on your resume, be ready to talk about it, basically, because that's what that's all they know about you, essentially, when they when you go to interviews, so they're going to ask about, you know, what was that thing you did back in 2019, you know, whatever it was, be ready to talk about it. So the day of an interview, you're going to want to dress to impress. Uh, you always want to, I was always told to dress one or more levels of formality higher than what people would usually wear at that workplace. So for example, I interviewed at, for a job at a restaurant at some point, the dress code there was jeans and a t-shirt. And so I wore slacks and a blouse, you know, so just as a, a little bit more, um, like one or more levels of formality higher. If the workplace is business casual, you want to go, you're going to want to dress professional. And then I don't know what's above professional, so good luck. <laughs> I'm sure y'all can figure it out better than I do. Um, you also want to arrive early, aim to be 10 to 15 minutes early. This gives you a chance to so can sit down, take a deep breath. You know, if it was a stressful drive or transportation of any kind, you can kind of just let that go. Get yourself ready to be in the mindset to impress everyone. You also want to be polite to all staff members. So for example, if you walk in and you have to talk to a secretary or something, be very polite to them because you never know um, who, like how big the company is. Maybe it's a small company and that secretary is also the person who's going to be interviewing you. You don't know. Um, or it's, it's just good to be nice to everyone in general. And so you make a good impression everywhere you go. You also want to stay calm, collected and confident. Um, remember to breathe and remember that you've got this. Uh, so that's probably the best advice I can give you before an interview. So let's talk about during an interview. You want to be enthusiastic, intelligent, thoughtful, and amiable. You want to show them through your, your body language and your tonality and just your expressions that you are excited to be here. You're going to be good for the job. You're um, you know, not here just because you need a job and this was the first thing you found when you Googled something. Um, you want to be friendly. You want to make them like you. So you want to be all of these things and just how you express yourself and how you just are. I guess the, the energy you give off wants to be all of these words. You also want to make sure you answer the question the interviewer asked. That might sound kind of funny, but when you're nervous, um, it's very easy to go off on a tangent and kind of forget to answer the original question. Um, something I like to do is I like to, uh, after I go off on a bit of a tangent, I like to answer the question and ask, did I answer the question so they can, you know, make me repeat myself if I need to. Um, that's what that is about. So yeah, don't forget to answer the question. And then you also want to use their answers to their questions to show how you'd be a perfect fit for the role. So that kind of goes back to the using the words from the job description or using a specific example that relates back to the job description, things like that. Um, basically show that you'd be you'd be perfect for the role. And every every word that you say should should convince them of that. 
it's also okay to ask for a moment to think of your response. So if you if they ask you a question that you didn't prepare for and you really don't have an answer off the cuff, it's okay to say, that's a really good question. Um, can I have a moment to think about that? And then just be quiet, like that's okay. And I've heard that some interviewers, um, I, of course this is all you know, on a case by case basis, but some interviewers are actually impressed when people take a moment to reflect and really come up with a good answer rather than kind of trying to make something work um, without really thinking about it. So if you need to take a moment, Um, another thing is so that you would like to focus on the positive aspects of your background. You don't need to apologize for anything non-ideal about your background. Say, say for example, you took a gap year because of COVID, perhaps. Um, <laughs> you don't have to tell. You have to apologize for that. You don't have to say, "I'm you know, like, I I know there's this like gap in my in my uh, in my background." You don't have to say that. Just say, you know, I took a gap year, and then you just move on to the next thing. It's perfectly okay. So the STAR method, as I mentioned on the last slide, is a way to answer questions, specifically behavioral questions, things like, tell me about a time when you showed initiative, or what do you do when one teammate isn't pulling their weight? Something like that, um, where you're kind of expected to give an example of something that you've done in the past. So the STAR method is um, situation, task, action, and result. And this um, lines up remarkably well with how we do when they lines, if anyone remembers that from last quarter. Uh, so the situation. You want to disclose the details of your specific event. So like set the scene, you know, we were, you know, doing this group project for Senj 101A, something like that. Um, and it was about X, Y, Z things, benzene and toluene, et cetera. Um, and then you want to describe your task. What was your responsibility in that situation? Uh, so let's say we're doing this example from 101A, benzene and toluene. Um, my responsibility was say to do all the coding for it. Um, so I was, you know, all the one on MATLAB typing everything. The action, describe how you accomplished the task. Uh, you want to say, I did like these X, Y, Z, very specific things. You know, I looked into the MATLAB code. I read the, I Googled extra things that I didn't understand. You know, all these kinds of things you specifically did to make this, to make this task happen. And then the result, outline the impact of your actions. The impact of my actions so that we got a good grade on the project. You might want to be more specific about what that meant. Um, but yeah, just the general idea of you did, you kind of set the scene, you talk about what your job was, what you did, and then the result of that. And the results was probably the most important part. Well, the your actions and the results will be the most important part because that tells you um, what it tells your interviewers what you did and what good came of it. And that's pretty awesome. So that's the STAR method. It's kind of a lot at first, but if you think about it in terms of kind of like what you wrote on your resume, it becomes a little bit easier than, of course, with practice at times. So then there's a part two to during the interview, during the interview, and there's some more like kind of uh, maybe greedy things, I suppose. Um, so for example, use good posture, especially if you're in person, the people can really see your posture, but of course it's important for virtual as well. So don't slouch, your body should be kind of at attention, but comfortable. So you want to look energized, but not like you're gonna jump out of your seat because you're uncomfortable or nervous or anything like that. You also want to main eye contact with your interviewers. This is really hard virtually because you don't know where to look if you should look at your camera, at their faces, at your face, it's very confusing. Just do your best. And of course, if you're in person, um, try not to look away whenever you talk. Um, so yeah, just want to do your best on that one. You should avoid fidgeting, sh fidgeting, shuffling, nervous habits, things like that. Um, I've been in interviews where people were fidgeting the entire time. It was very distracting. So as, as an interviewer, I would recommend not fidgeting if you can avoid it. Um, and then if you express yourself with your hands like I do, it's okay to do that. It shows that you're energetic and enthusiastic and all that, but don't go overboard. You know, don't hit anyone or anything like that. <laughs> And then you also want to avoid filler words, avoid rambling. Um, when you finish your point, it's okay to stop. Um, and then uh, just if you've made your point, yeah, it's okay to stop. I just read that twice. Anyways, uh, it's also important that you give more than a minimal response. So don't, you know, if they ask you, you know, what's your major at UCSD, you can say chemical engineering, and I'm focusing on this and that, you know, keep going for a little bit, don't just say chemical engineering. Uh, so give more than minimal response, but don't fill sound space for the sake of filling it. It's okay to let there be silence that gives your interviewers time to finish their notes and ask you the next question. And then their final point is to just let them know how awesome you are and you really want this job and you're gonna be great for the company. That's the main job that you have here in this interview. After the interview, there's just a couple more things to do. You want to send a thank you note within 24 hours of the interview. Um, if you don't hear back from them in the timeline they indicated to you, follow up with them professionally. You know, send them an email, call the HR rep, things like that. 
Um, and also if they don't tell you the timeline that they're gonna get back to you, ask them for that in the interview. It's, it's okay to ask for that. And then also reflect on the experience. You know, what went well? Why did it go well? What was challenging and why? So you know, if, there, if there was a question they asked you that you weren't prepared for, um, think about how you would respond to it if you were asked again. So yeah, um, I wanted, that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to ask the Kite Farmer reps, what are your interview tips? Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, so I'll be taking this. So I think we're just kind of reiterate what Lenora mentioned. You always want to treat an interview like a two-way street. So you want to be just as good of a fit for it, for it to be just as good of a fit for you as you are for them. So one of my tips is always to come with questions prepared for them, not just to be prepared to answer questions, but also be prepared to ask them. Um, it's always good to take a moment and pause. I really, as Eleanor mentioned, I really respect people when they do this rather than just giving me whatever comes to the top of their head. Sometimes the first thing isn't always the best thing. Um, another tip, if you're online, um, you can either put your computer in front of a mirror or like tape a picture of a face behind your, like behind your camera. That way it looks like you're talking to someone, even if you're not, that'll help you really make that eye contact without kind of doing that split, split screen thing. And I think that's all I have. I wrote That's a couple awesome. down if, I, if no one else has any. Thank you. A couple thoughts. I also really liked a lot of your tips. Um, with the researching the company, I often like to f look to see if there's anything in the news, especially with like pharma companies, there's often a big approval that they may have gotten before then. And everyone takes pride in it in the company. If you, if you kind of ha come saying, oh, I, I heard you got a new big approval of X medicine or, or those types of things, company news, this is one good thing to bring to the table. Um, I've had interviews before where, when you were talking about types of interviews, um, there are sometimes interviews where there'll be a topic or they'll, they'll say, you need to prepare a presentation. Sometimes it could be directed, like they might have a topic, um, but I've been in it where it's just said, present something. Um, I feel like it's related to that sort of CS, you know, computer science where they say, come in and code something. Well, sometimes they'll be asked to do like a, uh, I've had ones where it's been like almost like a presentation of yourself, um, like a portfolio. Where have you worked? What have you done? Those types of things. Um, one tip I like is get the interviewer talking about themselves. I think psychology 101, people like talking about themselves. Um, and if you have, when you're prepping those questions for people, um, and just say, you know, I'm going to ask the interviewer this. I don't know if you know who they might be beforehand. Do a little, you know, LinkedIn stalking and uh, have a, a specific type of question that might get them talking. Um, and people like to talk and tell you about their story and their background. People love it, um, especially uh, oh, more senior employees. They like to, you know, reflect back on what they've done and things like that. Um, and I reiterate the uh, be open to pauses that Alexa brought up too. Those are the ones I jotted down. Awesome. Thank you for the tips. Uh, anybody else in Kite Farmer, would you like to say anything? Y'all are the experts here. I think the one thing, because I think most of them have been talked about already, but one thing is don't lie. Um, I was interviewing someone, well, it was like, it was actually more of, they were giving a presentation because it was a mid-level position, not an entry level. And they showed some data and they had no idea how to talk through it. So it's obviously not generated by them. Um, so, you know, it's everyone embellishes their resume and what they say their skills are a little bit, but if you clearly don't know how to talk about it, if they ask you a question about it, then it's probably best to leave it off your resume. And, um, you know, when they're asking you for your list of skills or lab experience, for instance, um, don't mention it if you think it could be a, a point of contention. Um, they won't mind if you, you know, admit that you're still relatively new to lab experience. But they will remember if you <laughs> if you flub that and pretty much lied about what you could do because that doesn't that's not a good personal characteristic overall. It's a really good point. Thank you. Um, and I like the the tip for resumes too. It's okay to embellish just a little bit, but don't you know if you can't speak to it, don't put it on your resume. It's a very good tip. Um, okay, are we ready to go into breakout rooms? so okay or actually i should have asked um does anyone have any questions about anything that i or any of the reps said um if you do feel free to drop them in chat or mute uh i'm happy to answer any questions Let's see if any of you had 
have had to do a technical test on an interview, what sorts of things were you tested on? Oh, that's a good question for Archive Farmer Apps is, have any of you done a technical interview? No. <laughs> Seeing a lot of shaking heads. <laughs> I know it's fairly common for um, CS, but it seems like it's not as common for engineering, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> One of these days, Emily, I'll, I'll find someone who did a technical interview and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Any other oh, questions? Actually, I think I was trying to look up the company name just now, so that's why I paused, but um, it's Illumina, because I know they're a cross between CS and um, more like biosciences. So I remember when I interviewed there for a very initial screening, they did have a technical issue, but it was online and it asked you some basic coding and um, like behavioral type questions and you would have to type in your response. But that's the only type of thing I've seen where there's any sort of like technical questions or a purely technical, more of a purely technical um, test. Excellent. Um, so yeah, you can get some coding questions, some very basic questions. I also just remembered that during one of my interviews with um, Dexcom, I believe it was, they asked me some questions about like, uh, what is uh, a particular type of polymerization? Um, so you can get kind of theoretical questions like that. Um, PNIDs. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to put them in chat. Otherwise, we're going to start the breakout rooms process uh, because we wanted to give you guys some practice with some kind of mock interviewing because it does take practice, unfortunately. So Kite Farmer Reps, you're going to be put into your respective breakout rooms. Everyone else will be randomly assigned to a room. And then we encourage you to move around so you can chat with multiple reps if you'd like to. This is kind of networking also along with the workshop. So take advantage of that as much as you'd like to. Um, in your rooms, Kite Farmer Reps will be asking you comment interview questions. And once you respond, they will be giving you feedback on your responses. Uh, so hopefully this will be good practice. I hope it's not intimidating or anything. This is not meant to make you afraid. This is just a meant to give you some practice so that you, when it's the real deal, you'll know how to do it and you'll be able to ace it right off the bat. So Dan, do we have our breakout rooms ready? Um, I've opened them up for our reps and volunteers. So that should be uh, something that you can join right now. And I'm gonna wait a couple seconds, like half a minute. Uh, until I open it up so that other participants can choose their rooms. Excellent. So if you just received a um, notification to go to breakout room, go ahead and select that. And then everyone else hang tight for just like 30 seconds and we will put you into a room. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Uh, so yeah, if we usually like to go over kind of a, like what was something that you learned or something that you practiced during your breakout room. So we're a little bit low on time. So we're just gonna skip that. I encourage you to uh, think about these of your own position, I suppose. And then um, that's uh, just kind of part of your practicing for the next few videos. Well, 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 this time, what could have gone better? Just like we talked about in the slides a few minutes ago. Um, so yeah, thank you to the Kite Farmer reps. I hop around to all the rooms and y'all are having fantastic conversations. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with all of us. Um, I know we all appreciated it. I, I certainly learned a lot, so I hope everyone else did as well. Just a couple upcoming events. Um, next Tuesday, we have a couple things going on. We have an IT Projects Chipotle fundraiser. So if you'd like to support the projects team and you also happen to live be in the La Jolla area, I would encourage you to come out to that. We'll send more information on our um, newsletter. And then on Tuesday evening, we have an IG family event. If you're part of that organization, watch out for the um, Facebook Messenger post. I think they just revealed the event, so it's very exciting. And the next Thursday, we're going to be having our first winter GBM. We're going to have a Checker Spot information session. I'm very excited. Checker Spot is a material science company who makes um, oils from uh, algae, and then they use those to, fab to design, um, I think, Outback Skiing, Outback Skiing, something like that. Very cool company. I'm very excited to talk to us. Week four, we have a LinkedIn workshop at some point, and then we also have a town hall with the managing department. And week five, we're going on a White Labs brewery tour, assuming that COVID doesn't shut it down. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, um, be sure to watch up for more details later. So thank you for coming. If you'd like to connect with us, please feel free to check out our links to get this QR code here. And then if you didn't sign in already, please um, sign in at this QR code here. For anyone who signs in, I'm going to be sending everyone um, the contact information for the Kite Farmer reps who agreed to share their information with you all. So getting their LinkedIn and things like that, and potentially also some um, links to like, the application for one. So if you're interested in that, feel free to sign in. And other than that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming.